Rachel. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. We're really excited to meet you all in person um, and to share the ideas that we've been working really, really hard on over this past semester. Um, so just to kick things off, I'm going to introduce you to our teams. So first we have the brand team, um, Clearway Branding, and this is Rachel. She is in charge of equity for the team, and Macy, who worked on innovation. Um, also here, but not presenting, is Lake, who also worked on equity, um, and Alyssa and Jess, who both worked in activation. For the agency side, we have Mokshin. Um, I'm Allie, I'm the project manager, and this is Lee, who worked really hard on creative. We also have Michael and Angie, who both worked in strategy and analytics. So just to run through what we're gonna talk about today, um, first we're gonna talk about the opportunity for growth that we think that MuseNex has. We're then gonna um, introduce our objective, and then move into consumer insights and our strategic direction and ideas. Um, so starting off with the opportunity for growth that we think that MuseNex has, I just want to point out first that Mucinex is already a really successful and strong brand. They're currently the number one over-the-counter brand, um, and they have um, over $780 million in annual sales, as well as are the upper respiratory category leaders. Um, and the portfolio covers four key areas, cough and congestion, multi-symptom, sinus, and pediatrics. With that being said, while Mucinex is already a really, really strong brand, um, the problem that we found is that Mucinex is currently underdeveloped in the Hispanic market, and we think that this is a really big missed opportunity. Um, Hispanics are a rapidly increasing demographic in the United States. Um, so as you can see, they're projected to account for 65% of the population growth over the next 45 years. Um, they are also a really great target for the over-the-counter market because they currently account for $5 billion um, in the over-the-counter market, and through our research we found that they are more likely to purchase over-the-counter products than their Hispanic counterparts, or than their Caucasian counterparts. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, when we looked deeper into this, we looked at the competition and found that Hispanics are an underdeveloped market in over-the-counter products overall. So we think that this is a good space for us to move into. Um, so with all that taken into consideration, we're gonna talk about our objective, which is to increase household penetration among Hispanics. Um, so the rest of this presentation, we're gonna talk about our ideas on how we wanna go about that. So now Rachel is gonna take you through our consumer insights. Thanks. So um, we knew that our goal was to increase household penetration among Hispanics. So we asked ourselves, what does, what does a Hispanic household purchaser look like? And we found that in general, 93% of OTC pharmaceutical purchases are made by women. And within the Hispanic women segment, over 90% are mothers by the age of 44. So from these two statistics, we were able to say, all right, if we want to increase household penetration among Hispanics, um, targeting the mom is a great way to do that. So what does that mom look like? Well, meet Jasmine. She is the embodiment of our Hispanic target mom. So she's a mom of four. She lives in a suburb outside of Philadelphia, is happily married, a stay-at-home mom, and she's a second-generation Hispanic. Her parents came here from Puerto Rico, making her children third-generation Hispanic. And something that we really want to stress is that in Hispanic culture, um, the needs of the family really become really come before the needs of the individual. So it's a very collectivist culture. Um, the word to describe this is actually familismo. And so this is like something that's really prevalent all around. And 60% of Hispanics actually say that they are happier when socializing in groups. And it's really common for them to have large families as well. So approximately one in five um, Hispanic mothers has four or more children, which is significantly more than their non-Hispanic counterparts. And talking to our target, Jasmine, we actually found that it's common for her to have multi-generational gatherings of 40 to 100 people over. So this is obviously great news for Mucinex because when you're around a lot of people, we all know that you're more likely to get sick. And in addition, if you really value your community, when you do get sick, you're gonna wanna get back to that community um, as quickly as possible, and Mucinex can help you do that. So how do we reach Jasmine? Um, well, TV and social are what we've identified to be the best ways to reach her. So Hispanics account for 47 million of traditional TV viewers in the US and 34 million of the social media users. And in addition to that, 77% of Hispanics own a smartphone. So they are very digitally connected. And today, the two platforms that we're gonna focus on are Facebook and Twitter. Because although Hispanics over-index on many social media platforms, we found that these were the best two suited for mom. 
The last thing we want to talk about with Jasmine is that she's brand loyal. So 78% of total Hispanic OTC sales are name brand versus 22% of private label. So obviously that can be a challenge for Mucinex, but it's definitely not as much of a challenge with Hispanics versus their non-Hispanic counterparts. Um, and 41% agree I'll pay just about anything for my health, which is great for a brand like Mucinex because we are trying to get people who are willing to pay that premium for the best. So how does Mucinex fit into Jasmine's life? Well, when Jasmine's kids get sick, she's going, to, she's going to go to the store, and this is what she's going to be met with, is a shelf of a ton of products. So when you're sick, you go into the store, and you want a quick fix. You want something that's really easy, and you can just grab and go. And this is not what consumers are currently being met with. So this is something that's not just applies to Hispanics, but that we found in the general market. So when we did a focus group as well as survey research, the two words that emerged were confused and frustrated. So people really just felt like there was this overabundance of products, it was hard to navigate. Um, so that's something that we're going to touch on throughout in the presentation today. Another problem that we encountered was brand recognition. So when you bring up Mr. Mucus first, people are able to recall him, um, he's very memorable, and they're able to make the connection to Mucinex. However, when you're in the aisle and you're just looking at tons of brands, Mucinex wasn't necessarily standing out and they weren't thinking about Mr. Mucus. They were just thinking about dozens of other products and we found that you know the clean cut packaging isn't really um, an intuitive bridge with Mr. Mucus. So we're going to talk about more how we're going to address that later on in our presentation. So the key insight that we can take away from all of this is that when Jasmine's family is sick, the Hispanic mother in general is on a mission and cannot be hindered by the confusion at the shelf. The key benefit that Mucinex can offer is allowing families to get back together quickly with fewer disruptions by offering immediate and long-lasting relief. So that takes me into the strategic direction. So just to recap, our objective is to increase household penetration among Hispanics. And our strategy is to drive child and retain loyalty by targeting Hispanic mothers. And the three areas that we're gonna talk about today are pre-shop, shop, and post-shop. And I think you'll notice we're spending more time on shop today because like I've talked about before, we really wanna focus on that at-shelf experience because we have the data to support that Hispanics are much more likely to make information at-shelf versus their non-Hispanic counterparts. So taking this into account, the creative slogan that we've come up with that we really feel like encompasses our campaign is Back Together, Mission Accomplished. And we like this for a few reasons. So Back Together hits on the fact that when you're sick and you take Mucinex, you can get back to your community. But in another sense, we view mom as the family or the glue that's holding the family together. And we like to say, you know, when the family is sick, um, like everything falls apart, especially when mom is sick. So when she's able to get her family Mucinex and get them back to health, mom's able to hold the family together. The second part is mission accomplished. So we are viewing mom is on a mission in the store to get in there, get the medicine, and get out. But also at the same time, when mom gets Mucinex, goes home, and her kid feels better, that's truly the ultimate mission accomplished. So three words that we're gonna keep in mind um, throughout this creative campaign are thins, unburdens, and restores. So thins refers to the thinning of the mucus that happens when mom and her kids take Mucinex. And we feel like this description of the product functu functionality will really resonate with consumers. The next is unburdened. We feel like this hits on the relief that mom feels when suddenly her kids are starting to feel better again. And restores is lastly, is that feeling of just feeling like you again. So you've taken Mucinex, you feel better, and you feel like things are back to the way they were and the peace is restored. So with these things in mind, I'm now gonna pass it off to Maisie, who's gonna walk us through our strategic tactics, starting with pre-shop. So as Rachel mentioned, our first tactic is focusing on pre-shop, um, and this is how we're going to target the Hispanic mom before she gets into the store itself. Um, and both Allie and Lee are going to walk you through some of our specific ideas within that. Thank you. So to reach out to Hispanic market, um, to Hispanic moms like Jasmine, we want to create a ad that would resonate with her personal experience of going on a mission to help her family get well quickly. So I'll explain this as in a time order, the complete story. For the real shooting and editing, it can add more details, um, rearrange, and to fit different media outlet. So here is a Hispanic, friendly Hispanic family. Grandpa, grandpa is visiting, and they are playing with Mr. Mucus. Yet the evil Mr. Mucus hit them with mucus and trapped them into this inflatable suit. Whenever they try to get each other, they keep bouncing off. So we think the inflatable suit is a great way to show that mucus, how mucus burden people by the sickness and lock them into their own sickness. 
So after discovering that situation, mom's on a mission. She head to the nearby convenience sto store, um, spot Mew's next bite done. So Mr. Mucus follows along and tries to disturb her by mumbling and getting her legs. <laughs> She's unstoppable. So after she buys Musinex and gives them to the family, they're back to their normal outfit. And Musinex creates a shell that bring, help bring family together and leaving Mr. Mucus melting at the corner. <laughs> so I'll pass it to Allie for other creative <coughs> So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about our digital creative ideas. Um, as Rachel mentioned earlier, we found that Hispanics are really digitally savvy, as well as over-indexed on social media out outlets. So the first social media outlet we want to put our creative ideas on is Facebook. And again, um, this really resonates with our Hispanic mom audience. Um, and the way that we want to go about this is to put a couple of different ad units on Facebook. So this is just one example of what a static ad would look like. Uh, but we would also place a different ad where it would move a little bit, be a three second ad where Mr. Mucus would thin and like melt away just to kind of capture that consumer attention. Um, we would also include a shorter version of the commercial that Lee just talked about. Um, and we would do this by using targeted ads on Facebook. We think Facebook is a really cool opportunity because you can specifically hone in on an audience and really reach that target as effectively as possible. Um, and then we would utilize the Facebook um, backend optimization to see like what um, is working, what isn't working, and what to put our dollars towards. The other um, outlet that we found that Hispanic moms are using is Twitter, and we think this provides a really cool opportunity to really bring out that brand personality. So our idea behind this is to have a personal account for Mr. Mucus. So while there already is a Mucinex Twitter account, um, having this Mr. Mucus personal account is that brand personality of Mr. Mucus and extending that comedic identity. So having that um, account interact with the brand account and also with different things that are happening on Twitter. So here's just an example of um, what this would look like and like the theme of the Twitter account. Um, so here are just some of our ideas. <laughs> and then finally, for our digital creative ideas, um, as Rachel mentioned, the Hispanic mom is really invested in TV as well, um, but they're also really busy, so they're not always going to be able to watch um, their shows live, so they might move to a place like Hulu. Um, and this also creates the opportunity for the consumer to actually physically interact with the ad. So this would be um, an interactive ad that would essentially be our version of a Pac-Man game. So the main character in this game would be the sick boy, and he would be essentially what Pac-Man is in the Pac-Man game. And then Mr. Mucus would be what the ghost is in the Pac-Man game, trying to stop the sick kid from getting the Mucinex and collecting all the Mucinex. Um, and this is, again, tying this campaign back to the idea of a mission and also tying it back to that brand personality and connecting the brand personality of Mr. Mucus with our campaign. Um, and it also provides the opportunity for some brand lift um, because hopefully people will think this is fun and funny um, and all of the ideas people will like, share, talk about. So now um, we've talked about our pre-shop ideas. I'm going to hand it over to Lee to talk more about our creative in shop. So through our surveys, we found that 19 out of 23 participants showed that less wordy packages would, in, would help the buying process. So I tried to minimize the words on the package and replace some of the words with icons to make it more official and reduce the information processing time. And also, as Rachel mentioned earlier, that at shelf, the products are all sort of mixed together and the private labels are copying the big brands to make it a lot look like. So to make the Mucinex a standout from the com competition, I first reverse the color of the log logo with the background. So according to irradiation illusion, which is official perception, the light area appears larger than the identically sized dark area. So um, to make it even more pops up when looking from distance, I purposely put red on the X with Mr. Mucus under it. One way to emphasize that Mucinex X out the mucus and also to bring to bridge the disconnection between the brand and the mascot. So um, Mucinex already invests a lot into this character. It's already show up in a lot of TV ads. So I think it's a unique, um, to put it on the packages, make it more unique and hard to copy by other competitors. 
And you might also notice the gradation from dark blue to white and the dots from bigger to small. So it represents the idea of thinning and it help, the products helps you um, unburden from the sickness and also restore, um, help you restore back to your healthy state. I'll pass to Macy for more in-store experience ideas and also post-shop. Oh, here's, here's just another example what it might look like for different Mucinex products. So our second in-store tactic is to feature a trial size version of Mucinex. One of the biggest problems we encountered was that our consumers were unwilling to purchase Mucinex due to its higher price point um, without knowing whether it is going to work well for them. So by featuring a trial size um, of a smaller quantity, it could be about four tablets versus the normal 20, 20 or so that are in the packaging, um, our consumers could feel as though this would be a smaller investment. So they're not investing as much money and they have an opportunity to try the product and see if it's going to work well for them. But to also ensure that Mucinex is still making a profit off of it, uh, we would increase the price per tablet. So in order to prevent cannibalism of the, long, of the larger product quantities, um, so essentially it would be less cost effective to continue buying a trial size and hopefully our customers could transition into the normal size Mucinex package. Our last idea for post shop is to feature shelf talkers. Um, we found through um, our focus groups and a lot of our survey research, um, as again, that Rachel men mentioned, the big frustration in the store is the oversaturation of products, all the information, all the fine print, and not really knowing what product is best for your symptoms. Um, and this really isn't a Mucinex problem, it's more of a category problem. Um, so by doing so, we would demonstrate category leadership and kind of one-upping the other brands by featuring a symptom matrix such as this, uh, where our consumers could easily diagnose which symptoms they have and which Mucinex products are best suited for them. Um, we can also tie in Mr. Mucus onto the shelf talker, um, as Lee mentioned, to kind of bridge the disconnect between him and our product in store. Um, and this talker could also be easily used to um, promote other Mucinex features, such as the website, the Mucus Fighters community, um, and their social media. And one other thing to note was that in our focus groups, we found that our respondents said that a symptom matrix would be their top rated solution. This would be the most efficient tool in the in-store experience. So now I'm gonna move a little bit more into our post-shop category. So shop was all about the in-store experience and now we're trying to retain engagement with our customers after they have hopefully tried the product, after the Hispanic mom has completed her mission, um, it's worked for her family, and then she can continually be exposed to the brand. Our first idea is to revamp Mucinex's current website. Uh, we found that the website already is doing a great job. It has a lot of cool features that are very beneficial. We just kind of want to simplify the design to make it more mobile friendly. Um, by doing so, it could almost replicate what would be found in a smartphone application. And this could appeal to our digitally friendly audience and also help to eliminate a lot of the confusion that our customers are experiencing. We also want to include some additional content. The first would which be a store locator. In our research, we found that 63% of US born Hispanics are using store locators making it the third largest shopping tool used by Hispanics. Um, lastly, we want to implement a question forum. So this could just be a place where our customers could come and ask questions about Mucinex and some of their symptoms and figure out what product might be best for them. And they could do this by talking to a qualified personnel via a live chat or something similar. Our next post shop uh, tactic is product placement. Um, we feel that Mucinex could benefit by featuring, being featured on Jane the Virgin. Um, for those who aren't familiar, this tells the story of a young Hispanic woman who unexpectedly became a mom um, in a complicated sort of way. <laughs> um, and we think that this is a great fit for our Hispanic mother because they can obviously relate to a lot of the struggles um, that they experience when raising a child and being that protector, caregiver, um, kind of one that holds the family together and is focused on getting them back together. Um, and also, again, Hispanic women are watching traditional TV. And the last thing to note about Jane the Virgin is that we found that they have a solid, solid viewership between the ages of about 15 to 44, which is a wide range, so it could be good for the whole family. So lastly, we want to talk briefly about um, a couple long-term strategy ideas. This would be a couple years into the future. Um, again, kind of about retaining um, the engagement with our current target. 
but also extending that into a younger audience as a lot of these Hispanic families that we are targeting with the mom have kids that are gonna be growing up and essentially buying the product for themselves. So our first idea is university engagement. So kind of as we talked about earlier, Jasmine is a mother of four and some of her kids are about the age of nine or 10, of, yeah, of eight or nine. And 10 years from now, they'll be getting ready to transition to a college setting. Um, and this could be the first time that they're buying a product on their own. Um, they're not gonna be relying on what their mom always got for them. So we wanna maintain brand exposure on this college campus by doing campus giveaways. Essentially, this could be a survival pack to fight cold and flu season. Um, it could be a miniature sort of bag that includes the trial size version of Mucinex for um, college students to try and see if it works for them. Um, we could also include Arby's Lysol um, as a sort of you know, germ wipe, get rid of all the germs around cold season. And we could also consider partnering with other brands to feature um, like a portable tissue pack or even a small hand sanitizer all of which are essential cold and flu products. Um, the last thing that we thought of with university engagement would, to be, would be to time this giveaway with the period on campus where the most people are getting sick. Here at Penn State, we call it the plague. It's probably different somewhere else, um, but it's just that time on campus where everyone feels like they have to do everything they can to defeat their sickness or avoid it altogether. Our last, um, long-term strategy is related to e-commerce. Um, we suggest partnering with both GoPuff and Instacart, which are online delivery services known for being very fast and efficient. So typically with e-commerce, shipping can take about two days, um, which isn't ideal when you're sick and you need that immediate long-lasting relief. Um, so with both of these companies, our customers could be insured their product in a quick manner, um, which would be, would be beneficial to them um, and also with these companies, um, bigger e-commerce mark um, retailers like Walmart and Amazon are looking to um, use them to speed up their own delivery services. So that could mean more customers for us if we get into it um, a few years from now. So kind of to recap everything we've talked about, I know we've thrown a lot out at you. Um, our objective to start was to increase household penetration among Hispanics because um, Mucinex is number one OTC, but is, it is underdeveloped <coughs> in that market. To do this, we're going to drive trial and retain loyalty with our Hispanic mother. And if you think back to Jasmine and her story, her situation would look totally different um, with our tactics in place. First, she would be exposed to Mucinex, Mucinex ads that she can relate to prior to her family getting sick and her store experience. Then when she goes to the store, a lot of her confusion will be eliminated and her buying process will be simplified. And then finally, we can continue engagement with her and her family, um, both post-shop and in the long term. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. We thank you guys so much for listening to all of our ideas that we've put a lot of work into this semester. Um, and at this time, we'd like to open up for any questions you might have. Just in general, like I, I saw it come through in that cold and flu season in the, in the giveaway, but um, just okay. in general for the Hispanic mom too. Yeah, I think when we, a lot of these tactics, especially I would say pre-shop, so media, um, you definitely want that like in the fall, like right before cold and flu season when they're thinking about it, um, to make the recall as ideal as possible. So although we didn't touch on that, I think that as far as timeline, we did have that in mind, especially with the media. Very cool. Um, and then I also was wondering, if you guys thought through, obviously the shop experience was like a family got sick and she needs the medicine quickly, but have you thought through like stockpiling to have on hand at, you know, when the family's sick so then they, you eliminate the step of even having to go to the store? Yeah, so yeah. we definitely talked about that a lot as a team. Um, we went back and forth on it. So ultimately, we can say that what deterred us from it is that when people aren't sick, um, they're gonna be more price sensitive. So when you're sick, you're more likely to spend the money of yeah. Mucinex. So we felt like for this product specifically, we wanted to make sure that, you know, they're gonna be more likely to spend the money on Mucinex when, when they go to the store and are already sick. Got it. Yeah. Yeah, but we definitely think like encouraging stocking up could be like another opportunity with Mucinex. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but the Amazon 
on dash button is a good use of stocking up, yeah. which you guys Something could potentially promote that. more <coughs> in campaigns. Right. Excellent. Um, so all the ads, everything looked great, but I noticed it was all in English, and all the campaigns were in English. So have you guys talked through the strategy there, or making this bilingual? Or yeah, so we went back and forth about that a lot, um, and the research that we found is this target audience specifically is removed from being like first generation. So they're really moving away from that Spanish language, and they're consuming a lot of their media in English right now. So we felt that the most effective way to target that audience um, and also not move away from the current audience that um, Musinex has was to keep it in English, but we definitely thought about that. Okay. Um, Ashlyn has a question. Um, <laughs> 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 can you hear me? Uh, can we hear her? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we can hear you. <laughs> Yeah, so um, Facebook, obviously, we did find a ton of data that that was mostly the social media outlet that Hispanic moms were on. But we also found a ton of data to back up that Hispanic moms are currently a lot younger than um, the Caucasian moms. Um, so they are present on um, things like Hulu and Twitter and stuff like that. Um, so we felt that those not only resonated with the younger mom and with the Hispanic mom, but also resonated with our brand identity. Um, and again, with the Hulu, a lot of the idea behind that is moms are so busy and crazy that while they love their TV, they can't always watch it live, and that's one place that they would really interact with our ads. You had some statistic that was yeah. by the age of... By the age of 24, I believe about like one in three uh, Hispanic mothers, or one in three Hispanic women have children. Yeah. So they're very young. 24. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so it's not what we're thinking of in terms of the yeah. traditional mom at all. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, I have a question about your packaging. Mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> I know for a long time you guys went back and forth whether to have Mr. Mucus on the packaging. Yeah. Talk about the decision to finally decide he's going to go on the packaging for the recognition, mm -hmm. but what about the ew factor that I think was the reason why you didn't want to have him on the packaging before? Can you talk more about that? Um, one thing we didn't, at first we didn't want Ms. Mucus on there is we think it might be gross, and the customer won't, <laughs> don't want to touch it when mm -hmm. it on the packages. Mm -hmm. But uh, later we found that it, Mr. Mucus is what really helped the products um, make unique, difficult to copy because it already have a lot of investment into this character to make it more recognizable. Um, even if the private labels are copying the look of the packages and even create their own mascot, it's difficult for them to invest a lot of money into it. I have a question that kind of feeds onto that. Um, so I noticed a lot of, I guess kind of a theme about a lot of your um, like ideas was about brand awareness and sort of differentiating yourself that way. Um, do you feel like, and you, you have tons of data in the appendix that you might have touched on this on, but do you feel like um, the like the heart of the issue is increasing brand awareness or is it differentiation or kind of where are you guys netting out after doing all of this project? Um, okay, yeah, I can take that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, yeah, so I would say it's not that they're not necessarily buying cold and flu medicine. I mean, that's one thing, but mm -hmm. I think they're, like we talked about earlier, there's already this natural need for it, and it's more that we just found they were going to different brands. Um, and that's problematic <coughs> because it's a growing population, and we know that they're brand loyal. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to get in now and really find a way to like reach out to them and kind of really just hone in on their needs um, and things that will appeal to them. Oh, sorry, I don't know if this is answering your question. No, it's fine. But, yeah. okay, I just wanna make sure. but. Yeah, I would say it's just becoming brand aware with them specifically mm -hmm. um, and also bridging that connection in aisle because I think people can be brand aware when they're sitting at home mm -hmm. and they're watching Mr. Mucus, but I think the big problem that we faced was how do we translate that when they're in an aisle of a ton of products and it's very oversaturated. So I think it's 
about building the recognition from the brand awareness to that moment when mom is sick or kids are sick. Yeah. And going off of that, it's kind of that they're kind of interconnected almost mm -hmm. where one of the big problems that we found is the oversaturation like at shelf and how people are feeling frustrated and confused. So to kind of really strengthen that brand personality might make that a little bit easier and an easier decision and differentiation. Yeah. And something kind of just to tack on to that. So I noticed that you're focusing on like Music Next like original, right? But there's also different varieties of Music Next as well. How are you guys, or what was the strategy behind how you're gonna differentiate and, and help out each of those products to give the consumer a better idea of what product is right for them? Um, and then also around like the trial size as well. Did you guys think about four, uh, four tablets as being enough to get someone through a sickness? Um, and just talk about how you guys landed there. Or even a family, I, I mean, I was thinking that too, like yeah. four is not gonna get a family very far, right? Yeah. Do you, I, yeah. Um, so one of the things that we were thinking of with the trial size is usually it's like right when that person gets sick and I, from our personal experience and what we found um, when talking to other people is that nobody really uses that full box of 20 um, even if they do have families they're not using like that much they're usually using it just to get themselves through like that first really bad part of the sickness um, so that trial size is really to um, incentivize people and we do we felt like that was um, enough sure. so that was kind of our idea behind that yeah and especially with like the specific product that we featured um, the normal bilayer ta bilayer layer tablet does last 12 hours so that would get them through about like two days of sickness but like the, obviously we could change the quantity easily um, depending on whichever the trial size was for each of the medicines and then to touch on your other question, um, to kind of minimize that confusion, as we talked about, people are going right when they're sick usually. So the symptom matrix in the aisle we think is going to help like have people pick like which version of the brand. Okay. And to touch on why we picked like our main product specifically, we felt like in order to break into this market, our best chance was going to be to go in with our hero product. There's definitely like a natural bridge um, between like this and pediatrics, being that we're going after families. So that could definitely be you know like a tag on a commercial or something like that, but I think we wanted to just like come out strong with our hero product um, and then worry about, you know, the other ones down the road. Ashley has another question. <laughs> <laughs> So the idea with, hopefully this is addressing your question, the idea with the trial size would be that it would be a much higher price point per capsule so that, well, for somebody that's looking for a quick fix on the shelf, it appears to be um, more cost effective. But in reality, if you were actually like as a mother, like you might be willing to pay the premium, but when you go back to the store, you're not going to want to rebuy the trial size. Um, you're going to want to trade up with that trade up value because you're not getting the biggest bang from your buck, but you're still paying the premium either way. Um, so I think what we found, again, with the data and brand recognition is to go with the traditional TV route um, because our data does really back up that um, Hispanic mothers are watching traditional TV. They're really invested in their shows, um, and it's just also a way to reach a really wide audience. So 
we think that's a great way to connect the brand and our data um, to best reach our audience. Okay. So do you want to ask the last couple of questions yeah. or some comments? <laughs> so did you think, and so kind of going off what Ash just said, did you think about what that would cost? Did you kind of have like an overall spend on what this new campaign would look like? Yeah. <laughs> so, to be completely honest, we kind of struggled just because we don't really have the data. I yeah. kind of looked at a bunch of different things um, and made some kind of idea of a budget, and this is like really rough. Um, but we figured a lot of it would go into media spend. Um, there would be some, obviously, for creative budget, um, and then obviously packaging, because in-store is such a big part of our campaign, would be a portion of our budget, um, as well as the packaging is really expensive, so that would be a part of it. Um, but this is just really rough, especially because we didn't like totally have a budget yeah. like starting out. So yeah. this is just kind of an idea. <laughs> no, it's great. And I know, yeah. obviously, we didn't give you a budget for no, this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think, um, T, do you want to ask anything before? Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. So you had mentioned that um, the Hispanic market is more, t tends to be more loyal to other brands. Um, was there anything that like stood out to you as to like what those points were that stuck out to the Hispanic community? So they have this inside joke about like Vicks vapor rub, yeah. and it's yes. So that it's very bizarre, but you, if you Google it, you can find a ton of memes on it. And so there's this inside joke that Hispanics use it for everything. It's like their be all end all. Um, and there's memes out there saying like, oh, you do this, something totally unrelated, like use Vicks Vapor Rub, like for my GPA or like whatever it may be. Um, so I'm not really sure how that started, but we looked into it. So that's definitely one of the things driving, you know, people to go towards Vicks is they already have that brand recognition. So that obviously, unfortunately, transfers into the day full night glow. Um, so that's one driver of something that they're doing. I don't think the other brands that we looked at, um, none of them are, like outstanding or doing anything like particularly well, I think it's a pretty new area for these brands, but yeah. Because they're very homeopathic focused. Mm -hmm. So Vix tends to be one of those like more homeopathic remedies. Mm -hmm. If you think about even outside of like the non-Hispanic market, I'm sure, I don't know if you have grandparents, you know, like it was Vix for kind of that cure-all. So I think that's probably where that comes from. Yeah. Um, which was going to be a question that I had for you guys. Did you find any, um, you know, information on, you know, if they are not purchasing meat snacks because they're looking for something more natural? And being that we do have the guaivanesin mm -hmm. in there, um, any insight around, you know, that? Yeah, I think we found that they, in general, tend to be more traditional, um, aren't moving as much toward the natural. However, there's a millennial trend of like moving toward natural. Mm -hmm. So it kind of depends on, you know, if you're like Hispanic millennial, like does the more conservative traditional side of you prevail or does the more progressive millennial side prevail? And if they are um, that more progressive millennial, you know, looking for like those natural remedies, um, that could obviously be an issue, but we still felt like the majority of moms were traditional um, and that they were getting that advice from their mom and they still really valued more of uh, the traditional medicinal products. Um, and then my last question was, I know you picked um, Jasmine, and you said that she lived in Philadelphia, correct? Suburb of Philadelphia. Suburb. <laughs> is there a reason why you chose somewhere closer to a city, or? Um, I think we found that like they're more so in like sub suburban and um, urban areas than rural. Okay. Um, it wasn't something we looked at extensively, but definitely like found that they're not. They tend to not. And as a bridge, I would say that's pretty key yeah. um, in terms of where they're shopping mm -hmm. because it's not your typical CVS, Walgreens all the time. So I know something that, you know, we struggle with from a brand side is, you know, and from like a sales point is how do we kind of break into the different types of markets outside of like your drug channel. So mm -hmm. like I think I mentioned to you guys, but thinking, you know, more in terms of like those smaller bodegas and, you know, really higher populated, um, Hispanic. Trial size. Mm -hmm. Trial size for the bodegas. Yeah, <laughs> and that's, that, exactly. So that was, you know, that's something great because there's small shelf space in there. Um, so yeah, that would be like a really good place to pilot it. Great. But yeah, well, 
Good job, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, you know, I think it definitely, there was, you might have lost that little bit of tie back to the Hispanic mom. So just while you're talking through it, make sure you're kind of always bringing it back to, you know, the Hispanic if that's your target market. Um, like, I love what you said after the fact, why you didn't go with having ads, you know, like in Hispanic or, um, you know, in Spanish, I mean. Um, so just, um, I think that probably should have been like mentioned beforehand because it just keeps it more, you know. Cohesive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Thanks. Thanks.